Hi, David. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Stephanie and I love having like-minded wellness professionals on the show, and you have quite a story to tell and an experience to share with our listeners. Mm -hmm. Um, So we would love to dive right in, actually, and hear that story in a nutshell on how you ended up on a solo 5,000-mile cross-country cycling journey. Like, wow. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, completely ridiculous to think that that's that's what I would have ever done. Who who knew? I mean, really, honestly, who knew? I mean, I, you know, I. It's funny because it was actually started as a gimmick. The the bike ride started as like a gimmick. Actually, I was in the middle of of a project uh, uh, that was my my latest book, uh, which explores fifteen people's emotional journeys with cancer. Right. And I said, well, um, uh, if you if you think about a spoke, a wheels, uh, a wheel and spokes on a wheel, right? I wanted to fill in all those different sections with different ages of people, like different perspectives, were they a doctor, a, a, a patient, a, a nurse, a loved one, a caregiver, a survivor? Then were they young, old? Did they have cancer one time, five times, different types of cancer, different severities of cancer, and different emotional responses to cancer? because they're all over the board, right? Uh, Everything from fear to even gratitude. And, and if I could fill in that cycle, that, 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 that whole wheel, I thought, Oh man, that's that, that would like give us a complete look. And then I thought, well, geez, if we're all connected by stories and if I fill in a whole wheel, why don't I just connect all the stories? And so, you know, like one of in those old timey movies, when like somebody goes, like they fly around the, the world and this little red line follows them, you know, like connecting mm-hmm. all the places they go to. I said, well, let me, yeah. let me just uh, visit all the people. Cause I hadn't met any of them really in person. I talked to them for a few years on the phone, but I never talked, met them in person, most of them. And so I said, let me get on my bike and just zigzag my way across the country. And, and I went from basically from California to Florida um, in a zigzag way. And then, and then zigzagged up to New York as well to, meet as many of them as I could. I mean, let's just back up for a second here, though, because you're writing this book, you're meeting these different people that have been impacted by cancer, and you just decide not to like get on a plane or get in your car and drive to go meet them, but you're just going to get on a bike. I mean, right there, how many people have done that before, you know? So what's your mindset? Like, why why are you going to bike to go visit them? Because I I know maybe you can give a little bit context, you know, before you complete this bike journey. You've done some other pretty intense physical, mm-hmm. you know, endurance type of races, right? Yeah, a ton. And and I hadn't started that way, right? I started out being, uh, well, I I guess this act of my life, right? We all have pivot points. We all have transition points. Mine came in my late 30s. Um, I was overweight. I was a smoker, had been for 20 years. Um, I was totally stressed out. I was in a marriage with an abusive alcoholic. And I had four-year-old twins and completely stressed out in my personal life. Business life was going pretty good, but, you know, behind the scenes, it was really a pre- pretty bad. And I finally um, heard the right words and had the right set of circumstances where I kind of cared about the person in the mirror more than anything else. And I said, man, I got to get me and my kids to safety and I got to figure out my life because it's really not where it should be. And the first thing I, I, I did, Stephanie, was... Uh, put on a pair of running shoes and say, man, if you're a smoker, what's the opposite of a smoker is somebody that's, that's a runner. And I couldn't even run like two minutes. Like I had, I had, I had no idea, you know, it, I went on this journey in that, in that first year where I, where I went from not, you know, not picking up another cigarette and starting to lose weight and starting to fix my personal life and strapping on a pair of shoes for the first time to, by the end of the year, I had done like an Ironman. Like wow. I just, yeah, I went crazy. Wow. Like, I mean, like that's I, that's very impressive and unusual, <laughs> I would say. Yes. So uh, the driver at the beginning was, I never tried to quit smoking, right? I never focused on my health. I never uh, focused on my mental health. Uh, and I had been through a, a ton, a, a lot of trauma. I mean, some a lot of good stuff, but, but a lot of trauma. Some of it self-induced, some of it not but I never focused on myself. And my first thought, the driver was like, dude, if you're going to try to quit smoking and lose weight and fix yourself, don't fail at it. Like, like don't fail at it. I didn't want to make it okay to fail at that. Cause if I did, I got, I got nowhere to go. 
right? And so I said, don't fail. So that was the driver to say, okay, well, could run two minutes. So maybe next week you could run a mile. And then a couple of weeks later, I did a 5K and then a 10K. And then I did a triathlon. And then I go, man, if I could do that, like two months later after st- uh, stop smoking and I'm still feeling you know, 50 pounds overweight. Well, why don't I do a longer one and a longer one? And then how about a marathon? How about an Ironman? And so I started pushing myself like, cause I didn't want to fail at it. I didn't want to go, okay, well you started to work on yourself, you know, where can you go? But then it became a draw instead of doing it out of the fear of failure. I did it out of what can I learn? And that was the, that was a draw. And that's what led me to start doing more and more crazy events and more and more crazy things. I remember if I could tell you a super quick story, one of the first events that I entered when I kind of halfway understood like that I should set my goals really high was this 87 mile rollerblade race that goes from Athens, Georgia to Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. I don't know if you know that drive, but if anybody's listening is in anywhere in Georgia, it's not, they call it the gentle rolling hills of Georgia. There's nothing gentle about the rolling hills of Georgia. Especially if, especially if you're on rollerblades and you don't know how to rollerblade, right? But it's 87 miles. And about 30 miles in, I hit the wall. Like I was done. Like it was end of summer. It was hot. I'm miserable. I'm sweating like white sweat because I'm so salty, you know? Like it was, it was horrible. And I leaned over and I got this big hill that I got to climb. And I'm just like, what the hell are you even doing here? Like you're done. And then I thought, you know what? That's kind of cool. Like I, I reached my limit and now I know like what I'm capable of. And like, I guess I can go home kind of happy. I might've failed cause I didn't finish, but at least I can go home happy. And I'm, and I kind of know everything about myself. And then the other side of my brain said, well, wait a second, dude, if you know everything about yourself, then if you can take one more step, you're going to learn something because you're going to go to a place that you never knew you could go. And so I said, Oh, okay. So I took a step and I'm like, Oh my God, if I take another step, I'm going to learn something. I'm going to learn something. And like six hours later, I made it to the finish line and I probably learned like a thousand things, but every time I do an event or I, I want to take on like, a challenge, like a hundred mile run or, you know, this 5,000 mile bike ride or whatever, it's, it's not anything other than I think a learning experience, you know, that's that. And that's the draw. That's the draw to do it. Like, what can I find out? What can I learn? Which is amazing. I love, and yeah, I love that too. I love that you are so driven to just keep going, to keep pushing yourself. But one thing I do, what, one thing that I'm fixating on myself is your fear Mm -hmm. of failure. And I, when I hear your story, even if you didn't continue to, you know, run or do ultra marathons or Ironmans or whatever, I really don't look at it as failure because the fact that you just like picked yourself up and decided to make a change in your life, just having that mindset and acknowledgement is a success already. So whether you ran one mile or you ran 20 miles or you ran, you know, a hundred miles, like you, you made that change in your life. And I think that that's pretty amazing. Oh, uh, thanks. Yeah. And, and I don't want to say like, if you start something and don't finish your failure, I, I don't mean that. What, what I mean is that I, I don't really pour my heart and soul into something unless I feel like I'm giving it my all now giving it my all might mean I finish last, right? I don't care. Giving it my all might mean I got to quit, but I want to give it my all. And, and I felt like if I went back to smoking, if I went back to being stressed out, if I didn't start to fix my, my faults, which were, you know, finding problems to solve and measuring myself and other people's, what I thought other people thought about me, all these crazy nonsense things that just weren't healthy. If I, if I didn't, really apply myself to fixing those things and living my best intentional life. I know you guys talk about intention a lot. Um, If I don't live my best intentional life, like, and I tried it, I would really, really be down on myself for not giving it my best. And so that's, that's what I meant when I said that is that I, I didn't want to fail at it, meaning I I wanted to give it a hundred percent effort. And that's good, you know, clarity for our listeners out there too, who are, trying to do new things and maybe run a race or, you know, make changes to their lives. But I, 
I love you had that shift when you were in the middle of this race about what can I learn? And that's mm -hmm. what's motivated you going forward because that's powerful. And I don't know that that's something I've personally heard a lot of endurance athletes and people in, you know, in your shoes that have done a lot of these races have that mindset or use that as a way to push them forward. And I think that can be really powerful. Just do one more thing because you're going to learn from it, regardless of what it is, whether you only made it another five minutes or you finish six hours later, which is so impressive. Um, or, or, or you have to quit, right? You could learn that. You could learn you when quit, it's the right but time you learn to quit. something. Yeah. Yes. And it's always, you know, I even talk to my kids about this. And not to say you have to fail to learn something, but it's okay to fail in the sense, but you're learning from it. If you have the mindset that you're taking something away from that experience, whatever it was. Yeah. And, you know, especially if it's something that you're electing to do, like a hobby or a, an art or your passion of of doing podcasting and, and, and uncovering stories and coaching people or whatever, right? Whatever that, that passion is, it's like you get to do that. And so like mm -hmm. you might as well get everything you, you can from it. Like there's nothing, you know, that's a, that's the craziest thing that one of the first quotes that I heard about endurance athletics was one, from one of the founders of Ironman, where he said, you know, during the race, you're going to want to quit a thousand times. And if you do, nobody's going to care, but you're going to always know. And I like that because nobody's watching the things that, I mean, look, I'm not going to win any races, right? And I'm not some celebrity. I'm not Oprah Winfrey going to run the Chicago marathon where everybody's watching me, right? Nobody's watching. And that's kind of a good thing because if you're electing to do it, then if you don't give it your all, don't look in the mirror because you're going to be upset with yourself. But if you give it your all, when you look in the mirror, you're like, oh, what the heck, man? Like, this is great stuff. Like, I get to do this. I'll tell you another quick story. So uh, the first 50 mile run that I attempted and I did finish it was in Vegas uh, during the heat of June is the last weekend in June. You can imagine if anybody's been to Vegas in June, wow. it's freaking hot. Like it was 118 the high that day, oh. I mean, which is hot. Now I, I like the heat, so it wasn't like horrible, but I get to the start line. I'm, this is pretty early on, like maybe a year and a half or so into my, my journey. And, and I, I get to the start line late. It's a small race. There's only a couple hundred people, but I get to the start line race and I, I'm passing people as they're running. I'm freaking out. I'm racing to the, you know, driving my car park. And the first quarter mile is uphill. And I'm like, really? I mean, why are they going to start the race so early? Why is it going to be uphill? And I turn the corner and this dude is holding a sign that's saying it's only, and he had crossed out 94 and written 95 degrees out. And I look at my watch and I go, you know, 635, it's 95 degrees out. Who has a, uh, and I started like giving myself this hard time, like the hell are you, right? And then I go, whoa, 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 dude, like, seriously, you paid to sign up. Right? Nobody cares if you showed yeah. up. Nobody cares if you finished. Like, stop bitching. Like, seriously, change your perspective. And I went, ah, perspective. And I literally, I mean, I'm not exaggerating, uh, Stephanie, Martin, I, I literally spent uh, every step uh, contemplating the word perspective. Oh, well, when you work, what's the perspective of the boss? What's the perspective of the employee? When you write, is it first person, third person? When a movie, blah, 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 blah. And I'm starting to, you know, really contemplate the word perspective. And all of a sudden I found myself at the turnaround 25 miles later, like four and a half hours later, like completely oblivious to the fact that I've been running in probably a hundred plus degree weather for four and a half hours. Cause wow. I was so like changing my mindset and, very first question you ask is why do that 5,000 mile bike ride? Part of it was so that I could contemplate and understand my perspective and, you know, marinate on the stories and that kind of stuff. So it's, it, uh, endurance athletics, if nothing else is a really good place of contemplation. Wow. Yeah, clearly it sounds like it. I mean, maybe that, maybe that's my motivation for doing some sort of <laughs> endurance race at some point to contemplate. I need free time to to think, right? So let's dive in, David, and talk a little bit about your book, mm -hmm. um, Cycle of Lives, and, you know, the cancer survivors that you met along the way and the motivation for the book. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the motivation for the book came uh, out of my sister's journey with terminal brain cancer. And what happened was um, when I was in the depths of this personal, really, really dark period 
in a very short period of time, I, I kind of started to change my perspective. Like, like I, I talked about, started to care about the guy in the mirror, which sounds very cliche, but it, it, it was really stark, you know, for, I, I was oblivious to, to the fact that I needed to care what I thought. I know it sounds cliche and very trite, but it wasn't, it was really deep. I never really cared what I thought about. I didn't even know that I could. Right. So when I started to, I, I was like, wow, man, like th this is a whole new lease on life. Like I got this whole huge journey ahead of me and I'm really excited for it. And at the same, and you know, it came out a lot of trauma as a kid and that kind of stuff. And, and my sister at that same exact period of time, who had gotten past the trauma of our childhood, we we're very close in age and, and very close. And she was already kind of living her best life, right? She was happily married, you know, great circle of friends, really comfortable interacting with the world and her place in the world. She was just like grounded and authentic and really was her best self. And she was diagnosed with terminal brain cancer. And I went, Oh shit. You know, like she's got this very short journey. I got this long journey and this dichotomy. So we kind of brought that to our communication. She was really open to talking about it. And near the end of her journey, um, she said, listen, there's a, there's this event where a bunch of people are raising money for, for cancer research. And I want to go cheer them on. They're doing it in my name. And, and, and it's a 24 hour event. And, and, um, just put me on a, on a lounge chair and I want to cheer for them. And I said, well, sh you know, it's your condition. If you're going to be out there for 24 hours, I'll be on the track and I'll run the whole 24 hours. So we made a deal. Um, unfortunately she died two days before, so she didn't get to mm -hmm. be there, which was really sad for her and, and the people that were supporting her. Um, but it really made it so that my observations and kind of everything that was going back and forth in my head and, uh, you know, in and out of what I was watching was really heightened. And I noticed that when it came to cancer, um, uh, and, and it's the same with all kinds of trauma, but when it comes to cancer specifically, people are really good about talking about the tasks, right? How do I get my kids watched? Why I got to go to chemo? How do I navigate work and get time off and eat better? And, oh, I read this article about how to reduce stress in your life and blah, right? They're really good about that. But when it comes to the emotional side, psh, quiet, isolation, abandonment, you know, go hide in a corner. We don't want to talk about the emotions. And, and I'm talking about people that are super close. It's really hard. Like, what do you say to somebody? I can't tell you how many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people I've spoken to who were like, you know, I watched my dad go through cancer. I even took care of him at the end, uh, but I never really was able to ask him how he felt about it. You know, like th this was a very, very common theme. And I thought like, I'm super not qualified to solve the problem or even provide answers. But what I think I'm really good about is maybe shining light on it and telling stories so that we might be able to identify with people to understand a little bit more about like the thought of what people are going through or what they've gone through in the past. And maybe it'll allow us to connect with them and start these hard conversations about the emotional side of trauma. I thought that's what I, I could do. So that was the genesis of the book. Wow. The year, I love your whole story. Obviously not the part about your sister passing away, <laughs> right? <laughs> but just the impetus for the book. And um, I actually can relate quite a bit to what you're saying. My mom had breast cancer a number of years ago, and I went on my own journey of interviewing women survivors and thrivers mm. um, in the wellness space, like that had used alternate modalities in addition to Western medicine to get their cancer into remission. And um, I never ended up writing the book. <laughs> I ended up writing a different book, but yeah. that process and talking to all those women, it took me about a year was my own journey as well. So I can- And there was can probably mention. some, excuse me for interrupting you, but there's probably some, uh, some like um, identification that you have with that thought of, I mean, I'm sure all of them had some kind of a barrier when it came to talking about the emotional side of it with the people that, that were in their lives. Right. That's not, that's not an unusual thing. Maybe at varying degrees, but it's something that's very, every single person I run into has that at some level. So what did you learn out of that in terms of like 
how did the people that you interviewed want people to interact with them or speak with them about their trauma? Did you get any kind of resolution there in terms of what people would like? Yeah, it's it's complicated, right? Because um, what I asked people to do that I spoke to, not everybody was able to do it or I wasn't able to do it with them. Like, I'm not a professional. This is not therapy and I'm, I'm not trying to fix anything. Well, all I'm trying to do is uncover stories. And what I asked people to do is to say, let me go as deep as, into your lives as I can, right? Let, let me... And, 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 and I had to explain why. And, and the reason why is that, is that I, we, we might know each other, but I have no idea what the hell you've gone through. And you have no idea what I've gone through. And even if we're super close, like we just don't know. And we, we keep a lot of the trauma inside and we put it in a box and we sit on top of it and we let it collect dust and we lock it up with more things and wrap it. And we just don't, we don't deal with the traumas and nobody would know what we've gone through. We don't, we don't really do that, right? We don't talk about those things. I mean, some people do, right? But, but really we don't. And so to get people to get really, really deep into um, what they've been through so that we could understand how to identify better with them. So we could maybe understand um, it was a real process, you know, like I'll give you an example. I was talking to someone and he had a really crazy story when I first started talking to him. And it was like, it was kind of hard to believe, but he uh, make the story really short. He had to get a, a massive sarcoma removed from his stomach. Okay. Young guy, macho guy, didn't want to ask anybody for help. Like he never, he never did his whole life ask. He would never, ever lean in and ask for help, right? Never. He's just too macho, too, too whatever. And he has this big sarcoma and he, he doesn't even tell his girlfriend about it. Like he's, he's getting ready to go into surgery and she, she says, okay, I'm coming to the hospital because something's going on. But this is a major surgery. He might not survive. And everybody coming into the room pre-surgery is saying, dude, you know, you could die and we know, you know what we're doing. We're removing this and blah, blah, blah. And she finally looks at him and says, hey, dude, this is too much for me. I'm out of here. And she, she leaves. She, she abandons him. Like as he's going into surgery where wow. he might die. And he's telling me the story and I'm like, man, oh man, oh man. And so he goes, you know, during my recovery and during all this, he goes, I wouldn't tell anybody, barely even took a day off of work. And I had, you know, 1500 procedures between chemo, radiation and surgeries. Like there was no chance for me to survive and nobody would have known. And I'm as I'm talking to him, I'm getting further into it. And there's just a barrier. Like there's something not, you're not telling me, Joshua, I'm not, I'm, I'm buying your story, but I'm not, I'm not emotionally invested in you. Talk to me. What are you hiding that you're not telling me? And this was like a year of building trust with him. And he finally goes, Fuck. he goes, all right, I'll tell you. Cause I don't talk about it with anybody ever. Well, when he was six years old, he walked in to see his mom taking her own life. And as a six year old, Oh, I mean, could you imagine the amount of trauma that that could, it's just, it's it's not even imaginable. It's not even imaginable. And so when the first time that he leans in, you know, in his mid twenties to somebody to trust that they'll be there when he needs them, they abandon him. And it's like, if I'm working with him, if I'm working with Joshua, I just see this tough guy who might be going through something, but he's kind of closed off and I don't really know. And I don't want to push too hard. Right. And, but, but, but if I, if I know that story, then maybe if I run into a Joshua like that and I go, dude, are you okay? You need anything? And he goes, nah, man, I'm fine. I might go, well, I mean, are you fine because you're fine? Are you fine? Because like, you think I don't care or right? we can, we can go a lot deeper into that conversation. And I give you all of that as a long way to answer your question of, you know, what, what's common is that if, if we're able to form an authentic, quiet, listening connection with someone and really start to understand that there's so much more behind what we think they're going through, even what they're willing to tell us that they're going through. And we can just, find a safe space to connect with people at a deeper, deeper level, we can start to have those hard conversations so that I, I can say to somebody like that, like, dude, I, I'm here. I want to, I, I want to hear what you have to say. And I'm not going to go running for the hills. 
and and nothing you could say would make me you know abandon you and it you know i mean you you could form just a deeper connection and and oftentimes we just don't let ourselves become that vulnerable or put other people in a position where they could be vulnerable we just kind of walk the other way how many times you want to exit from a conversation when somebody tells you something tragic or traumatic because you don't know what the hell to say so to what I did with each one of these stories is try to go as deep as I could so that we could understand a little bit more of that so that we could maybe sit down with them in a different way. We could have a couple of extra tools on our belt to allow ourselves to ask tougher questions and start the hard conversations. Sorry for the long answer, but it, it's a real comp. It was a real complicated process. Yeah. Well, I, I think when you when you first started talking about emotions, there are a couple of things I want to touch on. Emotions aren't addressed with cancer. I think, you know, just in general, the society, most adults don't know how to express their emotions. Mm -hmm. um, most kids don't know how to express their emotions. So then you layer on cancer, which is difficult to talk about because it's a, you know, it's not a positive situation you're going through. And that just adds another barrier. And then, like mm -hmm. you said, these emotions get repressed, right? But I think I love what you did with these stories and in the book, because stories have the power to heal and then people relate. And so, you know, I'm sure, you know, you've seen like the positive feedback from the book and giving this mm -hmm. to others who are going through it because it, it allows people to have hope. And so that's what I think is really powerful about this, this book is the fact that you're addressing emotions, you know, even just in the book, like for each story, you outline their positive, their strongest positive emotion and the strongest yeah. negative emotion. Like you just put that right out there, which yeah. is unique. And I think really, it is really powerful because you, we have to talk about our emotions and what you did with that. The one example that you gave, you allowed that man to unleash something that he hadn't talked about in years. It was having, you know, an impact on his everyday life. I mean, to think about repressing that trauma and not talking about it for you know, I mean, decades. Um, so it's just really, yeah. it's really powerful. I mean, why do you think people don't talk about the emotional side of trauma? Well, we're just not equipped to do it. We're, I mean, as humans, we're just not equipped to do it because it, yeah. it well, like you said, we, we're, we don't do it as kids. I mean, think about this, right? Like, like right. there are, there's probably every person has, um, I mean, we have varying degrees of trauma, but but every person has multiple things in their life that define who they are. But but who knows those things, right? I mean, you can't get in your head. They can't get in your head and have the one million conversations that you've had with yourself about the time that some girl pulled your hair in school and spit on you, right? Like, like you had that conversation in your head a million times about how vulnerable you were and how bad it was and how shameful you felt and how mad you were. and how, uh, uh, right? You had this conversation in your head a million times, but it's been boxed up. And somebody that you would say, oh yeah, you know, when I was a kid, I got to tell you a story. Like they hear it one time and you kind of tell it one time and that kind of maybe gives a little light on it, but you've had that conversation a million times. So isn't it better maybe sometimes to not right. talk about it because nobody could understand you anyway, right? Nobody can understand what you've gone through. And so, and, and it's like, you ever find like when something's so super clear to you on an emotional level, and then you go try to explain it to somebody and you just can't form the words, right? Like, I can't get you to understand. Like, I can't even talk to you about like how, like when you go, oh, you know, like, like I could tell you I had a, when I tell you I had a mean mom, I had a mean mom. But if I try to explain it to you, I couldn't give you enough stories for you to understand how in my head, it's so quick for me to tell you she was mean and didn't know the full depth of what that is right and so we we just don't talk about it because it's sometimes it's just it's pointless to talk about it nobody's going to get it and, right. and that's that's the problem one of the things that i do is i give these expressive writing workshops right which allow us to have conversations with ourselves in a different way and they they allow us to say, oh, I have this inside voice that keeps sitting on top of this vault that that you know is guarding my emotions about some traumatic event. Let me let me let it out. Let me write about it. Let me read it. Let me talk about it with myself over and over and over in a different way so that maybe now I can talk to others about it. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think a lot of people, um, like you said, it's like two taxing and hard to try and explain where they're coming from. And so they don't even try. And, and oftentimes, frankly, 
on the other end, people may not truly care. They may be saying, how are you? How is your cancer? How are you feeling? But do they really want the full, deep, long-winded answer? It's like you have to find those people that you said earlier that you connect with on that very deep level where you maybe as the person that experienced trauma feel safe talking to and feel like they do truly want to know and hear what you have to say. And then, you know, the listener also has to be open to that, be open to whatever the person's going to share with them, really. So Mm -hmm. I can see where people protect themselves from, you know, maybe it's even from not wanting to feel let down by the person on the other end because they have to be able to handle whatever that person's going to say, if that makes sense. (laughs) Absolutely. And that's what creates a lot of isolation, right? Self-isolation, because I'm not going to tell you what's going on because you're never going to understand me anyway. And if I do tell you and you do understand me, you're not going to care and or you're going to (laughs) say something stupid and you're going to discount it. Or I There's a, a million things that go on, right? And so it's, it's really about building trust yep. and that connection. And you're not going to have that rapport with everyone, right? There's going to be certain people that you have it with and certain people that you're just going to have that more superficial, I'm doing fine, how are you relationship with? Yeah, we, we are going to run into a ton of people that we can't invest in them investing in us, right? We, we don't, like, you can't, when the, when you, you know, you're going through the store and you the checkout, the person says, how are you doing? You can't just say, oh my God, I just found out my my coworker's son is diagnosed with cancer. I don't know what the hell to say. And what the heck, you know, it reminds me of the time when I was a kid. And but right, you can't say, how are you doing is is a is a very, you know, loaded question. Or how does it feel? Like, man, oh man. And and I think um that you're right. You can't bond with everyone. You can't uh, form an authentic connection with everyone. There's a lot of reasons why you can't, but but don't we all want to form deeper connections with the people that are important to us? Mm-hmm. Even the people that we love and have great relationships with? You know, I, I honestly, I, I hate to repeat it, but I can't tell you how many times I, I've I've come into story after story after story of people who say, yeah, you know, Stephanie, I know you went through X and I went through X and gosh, I know we like feel the same about whatever, <clears throat> but we never talk about the emotional side of it, right? And within families, this happens all the time, you know? So yeah. this is Absolutely. a very important topic for everyone, especially when you're going through cancer or some other really challenging situation where you have even where you're experiencing more emotions and probably deeper emotions. Yeah. And not all of the stories deal with death and not all of them are negative, right? They're, they they all surround cancer sometimes from the, from the doctor's point of view, but, but they're all inspirational. They're all forward thinking. They're all, they're all hopeful. They, they all teach us lessons, each one of the stories, but, but especially if it's involving death, and by whatever reasons, the people that are left behind have a lot of unresolved issues. I, I'll tell you a super quick story. I was talking to this one guy and he was just like, after after we were done talking, it was a podcast. And he said, man, I got to tell you, a buddy of mine recently passed away from cancer. And I'm, I'm just like, oh, I feel terrible. And I go, why? He goes, because every time he came over, I went to visit him. Like all he wanted to do was like sneak half a beer and watch some football or baseball or whatever was on at the time. He goes, and I never like, like had a deep conversation about things and all of a sudden he's gone and he goes, man, it weighs on me all freaking day. And I'm like, what? And he goes that I never asked him like how he was feeling. And I never gave him a safe space to talk about it. And I go, yeah, well, if you run into that situation again, like I'm not saying that this is the case, but perhaps you were the only person he didn't have to get deep with. Perhaps you were the only person that let him watch football and drink half a beer and and, you know, he didn't have to be so heavy and he didn't have to be so mm-hmm. self-aware of everything he was going through. And I go, so we're left behind with this, this nonsense if we can't resolve things. And again, not, not all the stories are about death, certainly, but how great would it be to resolve some of these things, to connect, to understand like, hey, dude, you're coming over for for beer and, and, and football and I want to talk to you about stuff, but it, it, is this like your time not to talk or are you afraid that I'm, I don't want to talk or like, what's, what's going on here. Right. And then you could have some resolution on that issue and not carry it around forever. Exactly. And, you know, 
we could go on and on here. I feel like David, there's so much in the book and we want to make sure people, you know, get out there and, and, and buy the book and read it. <laughs> um, but as we start to, you know, we're going to need to start to wrap up the conversation. Yeah. We love leaving our listeners with just some simple practical tips and you've shared tons of different stories. Mm -hmm. um, but can you share your top one or two suggestions, maybe tips from your own even daily habits that people can do to start improving their empathy for others, you know, becoming more vulnerable, being able to like express their emotions and ask others questions that mm -hmm. will allow them to dive deeper into their emotional state. Yeah, sure. I mean, I can talk about a couple of things, right? From the from the book, from the, from from this book, this latest book, you know, I really learned the depths of the idea of of you never know what really people have gone through or what they're going through, and and I mean, again, I I don't want to put that on a yellow sticker and make it a trite little thing, like right? I mean, it, it's it's unbelievable what people go through and what they have gone through, the traumas that they've dealt with that they dealing with just to be able to get up out of bed and live their best life. It's, I mean, humans have it hard, right? Everybody does. And I don't care if, if you lost a finger, it might define who you are. And if you lost a leg, it might be like your opportunity to go a, a climb Everest as a, somebody on one leg, right? We don't know how people affect are affected by their traumas, but man, do they go through a lot. And I would say, especially when it comes to things that we can't wrap our brains around, it's very isolating, very lonely place for people. And so to give just a space, don't say you're sorry because it's not your fault. Don't think that they're looking for you to fix it because you can't fix it. You can't you can't make the pain of some trauma go away. Right. But you know what you, you can do? You you can be authentic and listen and and not be afraid to ask a question like, how are you doing? And and when they say fine, you can maybe grab their arm and look them in the eye and go, no, 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 like literally, like, how are you doing? Just that whole idea of being authentic and really don't apologize, don't don't have sympathy, don't compare, right? That, that's another thing that came from this book. Don't compare your pain to my pain because you, I'm not discounting your pain, but you you have no idea what I'm going through, right? So don't compare it. You, you can empathize with me, but don't give me sympathy. And understand that even if I tell you I'm totally fine, I'm totally busy, and there's a million people in my life, it's still lonely as hell. <laughs> like, no matter what anybody tells you, they're in a lonely, isolating, nobody gets me, nobody understands what I'm going through space. They're, at least part of them is, is, is dealing with that. So if you can just be authentic in the time you give and the attention you give, it really can, can work to both sides. That's beautiful. And I think that's such great advice. And I think, you know, if everyone was authentic and took a step back and just listened to hear other people's stories and experiences, we would be a much more empathetic world in general. We would. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, so David, how can our listeners connect with you? Where can they buy your book? Well, thank you. The, uh, this book, the the 100% of the proceeds go to, and you guys have written books, you, you know that there's not a lot of money in books, but uh, unless you're like James Patterson or something, but um, <laughs> but 100% um, of the proceeds from the book. So any any money that comes to, to me through the book uh, goes, 100% uh, of it goes out to charities. They were chosen by the book participants and they're listed in the book. They're listed on the website. So whether the book sold directly or on Amazon or whatever, my publisher's 100% behind this. Um, just 100% of the proceeds go to support the cancer-focused organizations that were chosen by the book participants. So they can connect with me on any kind of social media or my website is cycleoflives.org. Or um, yeah, just go to just go to Amazon and, and buy the book or Barnes & Noble or your bookstore or wherever. Terrific. And we know you have like a special offer or downloadable, like some strategies on your website. Yeah. I want to talk about that. Yeah, I'll talk super quick about that. So, I, you know, one of the fun things about the, uh, going from not doing anything athletic to doing a bunch of is the learning stuff. But boy, I wish I somebody would have told me some basics, like like some real basic stuff. Like, like how do you start running? How do you run a 5K? How do you do a, a triathlon? How do you, what, what kind of equipment do you need? And what's the basics of nutrition? I didn't even understand the basics of nutrition. I was 39 years old with four-year-old twins. And I didn't even understand the very basics of nutrition. Like, what the hell is that? So I, I put together this like 80-page book 
that just went the very basics of, you know, nutrition, hydration, equipment, mindset, you know, how do you train that kind of stuff for doing a 5k, 10k or whatever. And I, I just give it away. Um, so, so that's like a pop-up on the website. You can, you can grab one of those and have other books and my workshops and enga- speaking engagements and that type of stuff. If any, if anybody's interested in connecting. That's great. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. And David, as we wrap up this conversation, one thing we like to ask all of our guests is what does the art of living well mean to you? Well, I love that because that's where that gold is, right? With all of your interviews, it's like, you really go, oh, okay. If I could just put all of those in a book and just read them over and over. Yep. Um, so, so I thought about it and, and, and mine is, uh, mine is, in, is a, a topic that I, I label intentional optimism. And, mm-hmm. and it's like, you know, we all know people that like always see like the grass is greener and, you know, it's like everything's so, all everything is all roses. And I, I'm not talking about being like silly optimistic, but intentionally optimistic is just like this idea that, you know, it's all going to work out. Like we'll figure, we'll figure it out. Like a problem, although it sucks sometimes to go through it, like I'm optimistic that it's going to work out. Like I have some people in my life have to be in my life because they're family, right? You know, not, not mine. I don't have any family left, but except for my kids, but, 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 you know, other people's families and like, I don't want to be around them, Ugh. but I go, ah, there's 1%. They got 1% good. And I'm intensely optimistic that I'm going to be able to nail that 1% and make it grow. And they're going to become a hundred percent good. <laughs> I'm always optimistic. So I, I think this, art of living well is you know no matter what if it's a bad situation it's going to end at some point i'm going to learn from it it's going to get i'm going to get help it's going to work out like if it's a good situation right it's going to last forever i'm i'm going to make it i'm going to make it as deep as and personal as possible i'm going to take as much as i can from it right i i just like this intentional optimism which which is not a pollyanna and it's not you know, like just, Oh, just look at everything through rose rose colored glasses. It's not that kind of thing. It's just like, just always believing that it's always going to work out. Like it, like it will work out and and you're going to learn and benefit from it. I I love that. It's a very, um, it's a powerful, it's a mindset shift for people too. I, I like the intention and the optimism, both of those together. And I haven't really heard that. So Mm-hmm. It's, it's unique. And we, like you said, we asked this question after every interview. So, and we learn something that. from all of our guests, which <laughs> right. is amazing. <laughs> yeah. You know, absolutely. I, I, yeah. I don't have a lot in common with people that are just like giddily happy. And I don't have anything in common with people that are like pessimistic and like, <laughs> like, you know, like uh, walking around all, you know, always, always something to complain about. Always life is hard, but I don't have anything in common with either one of those people. But people that are like grounded and forward thinking and like, I'm going to do my best and believe the best and hope for the best and try to, you know, intentionally make things the best. That's the people Mm -hmm. I, I really, I really bond with. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on our show today. This has been. You're welcome, Stephanie. And thank you, Marnie, too. Both of you. Thank you. And we're excited for our listeners to dive into your book and we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you both. Bye-bye.